The Business is sponsored by Kingston Smith Chartered Accountants. I'm Victoria Scott and welcome to The Business, the show that's essential listening for the West Hearts business community. Tonight we're covering e-commerce and there's no doubt there's been a massive amount of growth in the development of online shops and shopping and tonight we're going to see from a number of different experts just how easy it is to open a shop online and then how do you get customers to find you and then how do you keep the shop moving forward. We'll be talking to Jason Salmon of FL1 Digital who's built loads of online shops both big and small, has a wealth of knowledge and is very generously sharing a lot of it with us. We'll talk to two different owners of online shops, Teresa and Liz of Aura Decor, a wonderful interior shop which has a, shop which has, uh, a whole variety of different products from beaded African hens to the most fabulous wedding table settings for the do-it-yourself bride. And in the opposite corner we have Melanie K Nicholson of Kalea who has a very specialised niche uh, online shop selling mastectomy swimwear. We have as our studio guest tonight Stephen Swan of Leapfrog in Harpenden. Uh, they're a specialist in the marketing of online shops and many other things beside. He's going to be helping us sift through the difficult bits and I'm sure has some very wise words to share. But first, let me introduce my uh, presenting partner tonight, Claire McAnulty. So, Claire, welcome. How's your week been? Yeah, it's been quite busy. I've had my sister visiting and because she lives in Norway, which is very expensive, um, she when she comes over here, she comes over with a, a very, very big suitcase with very little <laughs> in it. <laughs> and departs with the suitcase full of, of goods and clothes that she's bought when she was over. But the reason I mention it is that I noticed this week that Witch had done a survey on customer service and they did, they did the top 100 companies. Um, the usual ones that we expect are at the top, John Lewis, etc. Our favourite John Lewis. <laughs> yes, Lush was actually the top. John Lewis came yeah. second. Oh, it came second, oh. yeah. But what was quite interesting was that I, I actually saw the, 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 the top 100 after my sister left but because we'd gone on this sort of major sort of shopping spree I, I found it was quite interesting to compare it to her experience when we went round and sure enough John Lewis was the best you know we went in my sister had an idea of what she wanted within about two minutes an assistant came up and it was all very subtle not not pushy you know yeah, kind of help yeah. sort of thing my sister ended up purchasing the, the thing that so she I wonder wanted. what Lush are doing that's so much better yeah um, I mean it is a very friendly shop. Do you, do you go to Lush? I can't much? stand it. I have to walk past really quickly because yeah. the smell is so strong. It almost yeah. gives me asthma. <laughs> yeah. and, I'm, and I'm not asthmatic. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, I don't know what it is about it. Um, but, I mean, it's a very uh, a very young shop. Yeah, yeah. The, the, but they are they are very friendly and very helpful, yeah. that yeah. type of thing. But the other thing I noticed in the survey, the m and came in at 27, <laughs> which is quite low down. But, again, it was backed up. I mean, I know it was, it's hardly a scientific survey that I did with yeah. myself but again in m &S, there was no one around we couldn't you know she was trying to try and you know, try one of certain size there's nobody around to ask it's and not we, good, so, we it? sort it's of ended good. up um she didn't buy she didn't buy it of m &S. so it was just quite interesting sort of comparing so m and s you've got to get your act together on service yes, by the I'm, so. I'm afraid so oh well it's going to be very interesting so that's uh, that's actual bricks and mortar retail of course we're going to be covering all sorts of different retail but what caught my eye in the week um somewhat sort of linked to what we're talking about and what we will be talking about um, and it's to do with good old Google but this story which, which really amused me actually is that uh, Google is planning to adjust its search results according to your accent and this was reported in the Times <laughs> yesterday so um, when an Englishman and Irishman and a Scotsman want to find the <laughs> proverbial bar nowadays they will pull out their smartphones and ask Google for the best watering holes and the results well the Englishman will be recommended a dimly lit pub serving warm flat bitter Scotsman will be prescribed a dram of malt in a whiskey bar and the Irishman of course will be sent for a pint of Guinness. In other words, uh, re Google is really trying to realise its long stated goal of organising the, not only the world's information but it's also going to be pigeonholing people as well. I, th I, you know, I just sort of thought this is, this is just one sort of step a little bit too far for me but then I saw the end of the article which was even more amusing 
because it was also asking whether Google was going to be able to cope with the tendency of men to adopt tradesmen's voices when dealing with plumbers, builders and electricians. Evidently, research has recently shown that more than half of men do this and I know one who happens to be my husband who is terrible. Um, we get into a taxi in London and he suddenly turns into some sort of gore blimey <laughs> sort of like, how's your father? It's just completely ridiculous. However, um, fascinating stuff. Um, you know, Google really, really is sort yeah. of trying all the angles. I have noticed it more and more, and actually, do you notice that if you're if you're on Google Plus, you quite often get um, like maybe somebody else that you're joined with in Google Plus. Their information comes up sooner on Google now than, than other right. people. That's right. That's right. Seems to be quite a lot of manoeuvring now. Google seems to be moving quite a lot. But I find the yeah. accent thing hilarious. That's it's, 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 I mean, that whole Google Plus thing. It, it, I don't know yet anybody who who's really sort of taking it on board. It it's sort of it seems to not quite be happening. Whether mm. it's going to happen or not, I don't know. It seems to have been sort of drifting around a bit. But this idea that you automatically like what your friends like or are more likely to buy what your friends buy, I don't feel very comfortable with that at all. Mm. You know? I, d I don't like someone else making a decision in front of me about what I might want or like or want to see because people people want want the full range laid in front of them and then to make the choice themselves. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like the yeah. idea of somebody else making that choice for it's also, me. It's also sort of a little bit, you know, you, uh, you can't really believe that, you know, just because, you know, your best friend likes something, you're automatically going to like it. However, let's, uh, let's move on with the show. Uh, if you'd love to join the debate, you've got any ideas to contribute, you've got some bad experiences or even some good experiences Experiences, please get in touch. The studio number is 01727 839 926. Tweet at RV the business. Email the business at radioverulam.com. Um, and we'll be back with you after this short break. The business, sponsored by Kingston Smith Chartered Accountants. Radio Verulam Community Partners. Tressel Art Space is a community art space and registered charity situated in Russet Drive in Highfield Park. Home to Tressel Theatre Company and world renowned Tressel Masks. We offer a wide range of arts based activities as well as professional theatre shows, monthly live music showcases with licensed bar and a gallery cafe with exhibitions from local artists. Our 100 year old converted chapel is also available to hire for weddings, private parties and business meetings. To find out more, please visit our website at trestle.org.uk and please support us in bringing affordable arts to our community. For more on Radio Verulam Community Partners, go to radioverulam.com slash community partners. Join Simon Carver on Fridays from 6.30pm for The Film Guide. We look at the UK Cinema Box Office Top 10, a selection of the new cinema releases and the best of the week's films on free-to-air TV. That's Fridays from 6.30pm on West Hearts Drive Time with Danny Smith. Exclusively on Radio Varulam 92.6 FM. You're listening to The Business on Radio Verulam. We're the voice of the local business community on 92.6 FM and on radioverulam.com. And welcome back. You're listening to The Business on Radio Verulam. I'm Victoria Scott and I have with me Claire McAnulty and tonight's show is all about e-commerce. Now we know that the cost of entry has come down so much that there is now a website out there where you can buy just about anything you could possibly dream of. But how many are really working? How easy is it to set them up and how easy is it then to get customers? Well, we have an expert in the studio this evening who's going to help us with the tricky subject of e-commerce. Uh, welcome Stephen Swan of Leapfrog Digital. Hi Stephen. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, thanks for coming along. Um, Stephen, tell us a little bit about your background and how you set up Leapfrog. Sure. Um, Leapfrog's been set up, I have a background in retail for about 10 years, working before the internet was even invented, and I've put that together with about 10 years now of working in selling apps and games um, and l selling products on the digital marketplace to help people work out ways to increase their sales, and that's what it's really about. It's about improving their sales b business um, through using e-commerce and other tools available to them. 
And if, I mean, when you sort of say other tools available to them, there are so many different tools out there now. You know, I know we're going to come in, uh, you know, coming back into lots of details, but there are particular areas that you specialise in at LeapFrog, or do you, do, is it everything? To me, it, uh, we're looking at the broad p picture, so we start off from looking at the product that people put online all the way through to distribution and how they get it back again if, it's, if it goes wrong, dealing with returns. But in the middle of that are things like websites, obviously, but also potentially apps and, and other tools such as social media that help people to increase awareness and then engage with their consumers. So it's really the, the whole picture, the 360 it degree is, yeah. angle. And you know what we would look to do is to help somebody establish what their biggest issues are and to address those and, and uh, deal with them for them. So do you tend to, to work with businesses that are already established or do you do work with startups as well? Uh, at the moment uh, we're working with both. So one case it's a completely new internet retailer who's looking to grow their business and wants an app to work with and we're helping them develop that app but also to address the way in which it works with their customers and engage with those customers and another business is looking for something to engage with their consumers outside of what they actually do on a, on a day to day basis. And you must have seen this whole market change quite dramatically over the, over the last few yes. years. Do you think that the change in the last 10 years has been m greater than the change in the previous 10? Oh definitely, it's, a, it's, it's exponential. Exponential. Shadow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And what's the biggest? What's the biggest change that you think you've seen? Um, I think it's probably the ease with which people can get a hold of of product and information, and how they can they can address that very quickly wherever they are. So the the application of smartphones and the knowledge that brings with them, the fact that websites are no longer tied to a desk, um, that's probably one of the biggest areas. Bring it into mobile. And it brings the customer really to, at the cent to the centre of the game, doesn't it? Or, or you know, in charge of the game, really, when they can have a look at exactly what you know what everybody's offering they can compare prices they can compare um, sort of testimonials or, or what people think is good and, and what's not so good before they get anywhere near um, the, the actual shop itself as it were absolutely the so they do that beforehand and they also go in store and do it in store um, and we'll look at stuff but convenience is also still an issue so they're looking at, at trust they're looking at whether or not they can safely buy something from a, web, from a website and they're sure that it's going to come to them so they do like to deal with people they already know of uh, companies that they've heard of um, but then that information comes part of it as well and looking at the reviews and knowing whether or not they're going to get that product and it's going to going to be what they need. So trust, I mean, trust is something that's important in any line of business, isn't it? Is. it? And it, it's, it's going to be even more difficult when you haven't got that sort of face-to-face -face benefit. It, it is, but it's harder to establish here for that very reason, that you're not talking to them face-to-face. -face. If they don't know of your company, then they've got to work out some way to do that. Um, a lot of sites will do that by um, reviews, so customer reviews are important, but at the same time, they will also um, look at, at, at ways of reassuring people about delivery, um, making sure that, that, that they understand that they can return a product if it's not, not what they want. So terms and conditions become even more important, but do people ever really read them? No, it's not. It, it's it, Terms and conditions, yes, but it isn't in the terms and conditions. It's in the marketing messages that you get out of front to say to people, we will take this back, no no question, no no problems, yeah. and that's that's what actually happens in practice. Yes. And can I ask, Stephen, do you think Amazon has, has kind of set a mark for this for all the other uh, online retailers? Um, they certainly have uh, marked out a niche of their own. I mean, at the end of the day, most of the su very successful internet retailers also do have a physical presence. And oddly, Amazon as well have taken that back a little bit now and will deliver to, to um, drop-off points and things like that because delivery is an issue for them. So it is important that um, th th their, their position is, is quite unique and where they built that. And again, they have established themselves as a retailer of trust. You, if you found on Amazon, you're fairly certain that the price is going to be good, that it's going to turn up. Um, and it will be on your doorstep when you said it would, and that you can send it back. Uh, so all those points are important. So they've set certain things, but they, they're interesting to look at because their website is not one that's the prettiest website at all, um, but it does work, and they are very, very good at their analytics and understanding what, what sells and how to get a hold of you and to work out what you're buying. And I, and I could I, uh, and I could be wrong, but did they did they start this whole thing with with uh, customer reviews, or is that my imagination uh, that I it was started by Amazon? I honestly can't say who was yeah, first, but I they were certainly one of the ones who made it popular. Um, well, we're going to come back to analytics, and we're going to come back to some of these techniques um, sure. in a minute. But first of all, let's um, let's actually talk to, uh, to talk to somebody who is at the start of the process in terms of actually getting a shop on um, up and running. So I spoke to a, a mate of mine earlier in the week. He's created a number of sites for my clients, and he's always done a great job. Um, he's always really, really ready to help SMEs. 
uh, to try and get it right first time, which is not always what happens. Um, so I asked Jason Salmon um, of FL01 Digital just how easy it is to get your shop, shop set up. It's pretty easy. It's definitely a lot easier than it was maybe even 10 years ago. Um, there's a lot more um, off-the-shelf tools for doing this sort of things now. Things have evolved a lot more. Uh, most common e-commerce sites we've seen uh, seem to be using the WooCommerce platform, which works with WordPress, which is very popular. There's also tools like uh, Shopify. Shopify is a great online service. You can sign up with that. Um, choose a theme which will customize the shop for you, uh, start putting products up, set up your shipping and off you go. And those are definitely tools that weren't even around 10 years ago. So in generally things are a lot easier to get set up these days. Well, it's makes, you make it sound terribly easy but I'm, I'm sure it's not. Um, I mean, most people really would feel more comfortable setting up a shop, um, you know, getting someone to set up a shop for them and if that's the case, um, how, do they, you know, how do they go about writing a brief so that somebody like you can uh, sort it out for them? Okay, well a brief is very important. Uh, I, I don't think enough people do take the time to write a brief to be honest. Best thing is to never be too assumptive. So I think a lot of people just think that all shops are the same and all the functionality is the same. So there's no harm in writing out absolutely everything that you need. So if it needs features like say for example uh, related items where you go in and pick a product it then suggests other products. Um, put your assumptions about how you see the shopping cart working. Sort of things that people don't think about are would you assume someone can uh, register and then reactivate their account, bring their credit card details back or does it just need to push people straight through to a payment. Um, variations are a good one. Uh, it might sound like a simple thing, but different shops handle different variations in different ways. So say for example a variation might be with a t-shirt for example, uh, sizing and colour, but sometimes those variations have, have an impact on price. So those are the sorts of things that you might be best to try and specify exactly how they need to work because every type of business is different in that regard and that's always the detail that makes these things difficult at the end. Um, two other things would be um, have a think seriously about how shipping needs to work. That's again varies wildly over different types of businesses. If you're shipping outside of the UK or dealing with things that are very sensitive to weight and different couriers and different timescales, that can have a massive impact on how the shop needs to be built. Um, so don't just assume that all different variations of shipping can be taken care of. You need to be as specific as possible. And finally then, payment gateways. Payment gateways take quite a lot of integration to work with. A payment gateway is effectively a service that will facilitate the taking of credit cards and transact that through to your bank. Um, there are lots of different payment gateways. So say for example the obvious one that most people have heard of is PayPal. PayPal is very cheap, very easy to set up, but it does uh, take quite large fees which is 3.4% and 24p per transaction. Great way to get started but not always a good long-term solution. So pay payment gateways can take um, several weeks, even up to 12, 13, 14 weeks to get set up. So that sort of planning needs to go in right in from the, from the outset, but your, a designer can help you with that usually. Um, that's really useful advice. Um, realistically, uh, what's the sort of minimum cost you could get a shop up with and, and minimum sort of amount of time? I mean, no one's going to hold you to this, Jason, but, you know, just give people an idea. It's always, it's always cheaper to take something off the shelf. So something like Shopify, really, you're usually going to be paying for someone's time to perhaps give you some training and assist you in setting it up. That's usually the cheapest way to do it, so in which case you can get set up for £500, that sort of figure. Um, the next stage up might be if you're looking at something like uh, WooCommerce with WordPress, those sorts of sites we've done for under a thousand pounds, but usually we're taking an off-the-shelf pre-built website and just applying some training and some customization. The, the, the downside is, is you don't necessarily get all the ultimate uh, flexibility and functionality you want, but you can get something very quickly built. So in terms of time scales, normally a couple of a couple of weeks to get it all set up. The thing that really takes the time is sourcing all of the all the products, the descriptions, um, getting all of the products set up on the site. That that's the thing that takes time. And that's the bit that the client has to do, and that's what stalls everything. <laughs> yeah, because even if you're paying someone to do it for you, you still need to source all the information to give it to them to do it for you. And quite often these days, I I get most of my clients to do it themselves because it's it's actually a lot lot quicker and a lot easier. 
And that was Jason Salmon of FL1 Digital, based here in St Albans. Uh, Stephen, it sounded like there was a heck of a lot there that uh, you need to consider when you're planning your online shop, the shopping experience, the payment, the carriage, the T's and C's, etc. Uh, what, in your experience, are the things that n a new online retailer should be putting emphasis on in their planning stages? I think the, um, the important bit for me is not to try and do it all at once, but to get started and to do something, to experiment in a small way. So um, Jason described there very successfully the idea of buying effectively an off-the-shelf uh, website with e-commerce functionality, and that works, and you can get you going. Um, but you're not going to get the same, same level of sales as Amazon or anything immediately from it. So you're going to get off the, off the ground and learn about the environment and start to get au fait with the, the relevant technology. Um, there are other ways, there are even simpler versions. You can, for example, push your product out on Amazon itself without ever building a website, and that's another way to go, and there are other similar services. Um, but gradually, I think if you do that, you're not really learning about the business, you're just finding another route to market. And I think the way in which Jason described it, buying a small off-the-shelf website is a good way to go if you're, if you're a small business trying to get established to find some ways with things that already work and are successful for them. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to go, but eventually you you're going, if you're successful, you're going to outgrow that and you're going to have to come become more bespoke and get to grips with more and more of those details. So, but it is probably quite a good idea to, to start small um, yes. and, and start with one of these sort of boxed sets, uh, uh, box sets, no, that's TV, <laughs> isn't it? No, I mean, one of these box sort of box yes. products, yes. really. Um, but do you still need help getting set up or can you really do that yourself? Uh, it depends upon your technical comfort um, and probably in most cases people are happier to get someone to do it. Um, I think the biggest mistake is to use somebody who themselves is inexperienced and actually hasn't got the knowledge of what they're doing. And so you really need to talk to the supplier and find out what they're doing and why it works and the sort of products they're going to be having and the tools and features that you will have. So Jason described there that these um, box products come with, with fixed features and that's true. And it's like buying a car. If you want to have a new feature, it's going to cost you a lot more to get it fitted after the event. Um, and so in this case, you want to, to make sure that this has the core things that you need Need that, it that matches the needs of your business um, and if you do then it's likely to be successful and I think some of the things that he mentioned as well um, don't people don't automatically think about um, you know things like carriage things things yep. like the payment options things things that you know actually sound quite complicated like you know if you're going to buy this t-shirt which jeans does it go with and all of that sort of stuff are all of those things you know are, are they essential to start off with or can you just get your PayPal set up uh, have a very simple T and C system and you know not worry about the complexities of, of multi-purchase so things like the the purchasing it will affect your sales if you don't offer alternatives so paypal is one way um but if you don't offer credit cards as well and other things then you will not make as many sales but you'll begin to learn and you'll begin to find out the way the things that are successful for you and then you can add new features in um, most of those off the off the shelf things would have those facilities to include paypal and credit cards and everything else but you'll still need to do the deal with the provider and negotiate the terms of that but that's the same as, as selling in your store and a lot of of businesses will already have that if they're established they'll already be taking credit card payments so it's a question of moving that over I mean one of the other things that um, that I've noticed with some of my clients and, and some of my own personal experience as well is that there's an awful lot of excitement and, and um, time and energy spent on the products yes and and actually getting almost too many products before you even know what it is that people are going to buy a sort of like wild assumption that they're going to buy what you like um, straight yeah. off um, how do people control that <laughs> that I think it's um, for that what you really have for a website is you you have a, the same as a retailer a physical retailer would think of in terms of uh, uh, the, um, the the range of products that you put as you walk in the store on the end of the of the aisle that people see first and that's what you're getting with a website when people first walk in you've got to decide what you're going to hit them with first and what's going to be a bigger story now as you get to know that cons that, that person uh, digitally you get to know them you can then track them and if you want to this gets much more sophisticated but you can actually change the product that you show to each individual customer as they come in um, and that's the way in which you can make it more 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 adaptive to that individual it does get confusing so when my children go on to my amazon account to buy things <laughs> i now get recommendations for all sorts of strange things it's bringing me back to that google story where you know the scottish person comes on and they just get shown kilts yeah. <laughs> is it going to work there i don't think so, no. I don't think so. <laughs> so it's so that, that's that's the sort of thing you can do but it's about merchandising your site and and at the moment if you're starting out fresh then then learn with your top 10 bestsellers and but 
think about whether they're actually going to appeal to somebody to buy um, online. And it may be that purchase is never completed online. Maybe they come into your shop or to your business to actually make the sales. So an example of that would be a car manufacturer. I can't think that they've ever really sold a car online to a consumer sitting at home. Um, but lots of people will do their research online before they go into the, to the garage and actually place the order. So high ticket items would fall into that. Um, so you, you mentioned analytics before. Um, I mean, that's yes. got to be absolutely crucial. That you don't even think about having a website without having uh, um, analytics. Absolutely. Input. And it's amazing the number of people I speak to who, when you ask them about analytics, say, yes, I have it. And you say, what do you have? We have Google Analytics. And then they say, uh, you say have you looked at it? No. <laughs> I've <laughs> heard that so many times as well. So it's like having a fire alarm without a battery fitted you've got to actually look at them occasionally and and see what they're doing well they're, they're very interesting as well or am i just a real geek but I, but you get really hooked on them. well you can get hooked but they can also be scary to people who aren't happy with graphs and numbers um, but at the end of the day focus on 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 a couple of points and improve those points one at a time uh, what you get as well from google analytics off the shelf is it'll show you which pages of your website people are going to it's actually quite a small piece of work for your developer to put in specific events and so that you can track exactly what buttons people pressed and in what order they did and that's where you can test those sort of things and it's possible to to also change the website dynamically so some people get a green button and some people get a red button and you can work out which is the most successful it's always going to be red that's my experience with media <laughs> red just attracts the eye um one of the other things about about the whole sort of google analytics thing is um and i would always recommend people do this really early on is to take yourself out of the equation and you can do that relatively easily can't you because otherwise you know you sort of think oh that's fantastic you know the website's only just gone live and there's already been 100 people looking at it and then you yes. actually if you take yourself out you'll realize that 98 of them were you just checking what it looked like checking that it was still there checking all the sort of stuff you can take yourself out of those uh, yeah, equations quite quickly can't absolutely. you absolutely Yes. So, if you um, are out there and you've got um, experience of online retail, you're just about to start a shop, or you uh, would just like to join the discussion and uh, contribute some ideas, please give us a ring. Uh, our studio number is 01727 839926. Tweet us at RV the Business. Email the business at Radio Verulam. And we will be back with some more clips and some more discussion after this short break. The Business, sponsored by Kingston Smith Chartered Accountants. At Kingston Smith, our ethos is simple. We want our clients to succeed. Welcoming owner-managed businesses and individuals, we pride ourselves on offering the local business community a range of services that best supports their needs for maximum growth. Kingston Smith, helping our clients succeed. Find us on St. Peter Street in the heart of St. Albans. Or for more information, head to kingstonsmith.co.uk. Join me, Tatiana Colombo, on the Radio Verulam Sofa for the Sunday Supplement. Every week from 10 to midday, we'll have entertainment news, desert island dish, television highlights, and the sound of Sunday. That's the Sunday Supplement with me, Tatiana Colombo, from 10 a.m. to midday on 92.6 FM, Radio Verulam. If you want to get in touch with the business on Radio Verulam, phone us on 01727 839 926 or email thebusiness at radioverulam.com. And welcome back to The Business. I'm Victoria Scott and I'm here with fellow presenter Claire McAnulty and our studio guest Stephen Swan of Leapfrog, who's a retail and e-commerce specialist. We're going to be we're talking all about e-commerce. We've just been hearing from Jason Salmon of FL1 Digital, who specialises in building all sorts of web websites. If you're building a website, if you've got an online shop or you just want to join the debate or have some ideas to contribute, please give us a ring on 01727 839926. Tweet at all the be at RV the business, email the business at radioverulam.com um, and join the discussion. Now, the next uh, clip that we've got is, um, in fact, we've got two clips. Um, the, they are e-commerce site owners. And the first clip is um, Aura Decor Design. This is Liz and Teresa. They've got um, a, quite a, a large e-commerce site selling all sorts of extraordinarily beautiful things um, for interiors. I started by asking Teresa how it all came about. Well, we originally started on a market stall. 
and uh, selling textiles and anything with a bit of a South African flavour. And we decided, because some of our designs were so popular, we thought we'd put it out on the web. How difficult was it to get it out on the web? It sounds uh, very, very easy, but I'm sure it wasn't. And, and I know that you've got quite a large website with a lot of product on it. So just how difficult was it? Well, we had a really fantastic uh, web development team who created the website for us. Um, and we are fortunately been able to maintain it ourselves. So as we get new products, we upload them ourselves. We have a lot of fun doing this, um, selecting which photographs best suit the products. We have quite a large range, and uh, we add to it uh, quite regularly. And I know that, Liz, you're the, uh, you're, you're the creative person in the mix. So how do you go about choosing what should be on the website? Really, it's about finding something that works in the British market in terms of interiors and gifting and then making it more almost giving it a fun twist perhaps we'll use something which is more colorful or um, something which might be a little bit more African say for instance beaded how do you manage that sort of concept of, of having a lot of stock well some of the product we actually do make ourselves so we can quite easily manage that um, um, some of the product we, um, we we can't really it's either too large so we don't carry a lot of stock but we always try and have um, a limited amount so that we can fulfill orders uh, quite quickly. That's quite important to be able to uh, have a quick turnaround. We use various um, methods of shipping depending on, on the size of the, the product. Some of us, you know, they, they can be quite large uh, or they can be small. So that does, uh, to some extent, determine how much stock we carry off. In, in the pricing of these sorts of products, obviously you've got sort of profitability um, requirements. But are there, are there certain sort of price levels that you think people won't um, be prepared to pay for certain items? I think you have to look at your product range. You've got to start sort of at the low end with something that's an entry price point, something that's attractive and that they would, a customer would identify with and purchase. But then equally, you've got to have a, a good selection across the price banding. And for an item which is unusual and which has had to travel a long distance and it is different and it's something that's going to speak in your home um, and make you stand out, then you would actually spend a lot more money on that type of item. For that we do have the much higher price points but there is a critical price point that we won't cross over in terms of being too expensive. Was it difficult to set up the, um, the, the payment security system and the, the shop itself? No, not really because we um, we had the web developers guiding us and we use, you know, there's so many tools out there, PayPal, so we use that as a, we use that as a, a method of payment on our online shop. When we're out and about doing fares, we use iZettle, which is um, a, a mobile means that uses your smartphone. So. I think you, you do need to be able to offer your customers um, payment by card. It doesn't carry a lot, lot of... So, no, it hasn't been that difficult. We just use the tools. Okay, so if you were to do it all over again and you were going to offer sort of one piece of advice each to um, somebody that was setting up an online store, what do you think would be the key learning that, you've, that you would think, gosh, if I could do it again, I'd do that differently? I think I would start off with a smaller range and um, n now knowing what I've learned over the, the two years that we have been online is how important the copy is on your website and um, we've had to slowly improve on that and I think if you get that right first time so think about your products, think about your images that they reflect your products really well, think about the words that people are most likely to be typing in, looking for those types of products, getting all that right up front, I think that would be my key advice to someone starting up. Now I see Liz is nodding sagely, is there anything you'd like to add to that Liz? No, I think that uh, our learning curve has been extremely steep and one of the things I would start with would be look at the product and look at the search engine optimization words. That for me would be key and I would probably pay somebody to take photographs and have a very standardized type of photographs so the whole website would look the same if possible. That's really really good advice. Um, now have you got any any new developments that are... We're really excited because we are launching a um, 
a range of table decoration sets, uh, something quite different. We haven't found any um, similar product out there, so we're very excited to bring it to market. Um, we have a few themes that we are launching with, and um, th these table decoration sets are appropriate for weddings, they're for anniversaries, christenings, any type of special occasion. And um, yeah, it's it's been a good few year, well a year about of hard work, but we are there, we are about to launch to market, and we're very excited. That's very exciting. So, well, we wish you every success, and thank you very much for your time. And Stephen there, that was quite interesting that um, that Liz and Teresa were talking about, they started off in a market stall. Sure. So in terms of a, a sort of low cost way of finding out what customers want, is, is that, um, do, do other people do that as a way of finding out or do well, people go straight on to an online shop these I days? I believe the classic one was Marks and Spencers I think started yes, on a market stall many many years ago. And, so. and Tesco. And Tesco's, yeah. So I, I think there's lots of ways to do it and getting in front of real customers and getting real feedback is, is good because certainly if if you sell online and you don't engage with your customers then you're not going to get that feedback and so getting out there in some way or another with your product in front of real consumers is a good thing to do tying in um, the, the, the the benefits of, of real life retail and online retail is is probably the way to go and the way in which most people will be successful and one of the things I think that they that a lot of people don't appreciate which is the benefits that comes from that is the two are quite different from a financial point of view from a profit and loss point of view yes they both give you sales but the costs that go with them are quite different different and therefore that gives the opportunity to mix and match a bit so for example if you've got four or five physical retail outlets and you open an online store then you could be having your staff in the shops deal with with the packaging and sending stuff out and product out uh, at the same time so you're going to get better usage um, that's a problem that even the big guys people like the the food retailers Ocado and people struggle with because the cost they found of collecting the shopping and sending it out actually makes those businesses loss making um, but, but if they'd kept the two together Together with their original business, they actually had a scope potentially to be more profitable. I think they've got to they've got to crack that one. But for smaller businesses, it's actually easier. I think too. Would, would it be right in thinking that in terms of if having a market stall, you could afford to maybe have small amounts of things to test out? So let's say you tested out, I don't know, thirty products, forty products. Whereas if you go online, you've really got to have waiting in the wings. Maybe I don't know a hundred of those products in case you get a whole load of people buying. Or is this is a slightly different thing in terms I've of having stock, is it? I think you're, I don't think you're right on that one, actually. Okay. I think, um, I think I, uh, even when you're online, you can manage the expectations of the customers. So what you have to do is, if you start to sell out, you have to say, this will go to an order time. And that w might impact your sales, but then you can gear up that product. What I wouldn't encourage anybody to do is to overstock in the expectation of vast sales taking through, mm. because that's, that's not going to go well if you get that product wrong. So you need to test with small numbers and find out what's popular, and then stock up on those and sell them. And there was the you know the infamous sort of biggest online shoe uh, store that now exists that actually started off by putting a whole range of shoes on um, a website that didn't actually exist. Yeah. And then when people ordered, he literally nipped to the shops and bought <laughs> shoes um, and then sent them out. You know, and that was that was the way that he sort of f figured out that people did actually and were prepared to buy shoes on online. I mean, that, they that don't buy shoes anywhere, far, but, but, um, but I think, it was how I it think started. you, you yeah. certainly don't want to overstock at that mm. initial stage and find out whether you've got the sales for them. Again, going back to the to the fact that if you've got a physical store or a physical way of selling, not even a store, if it's your, if it's your market bar or whatever, that's going to work well because you've got two chances to sell that stock. Um, and then you can, you, you can use one to sell something that you're not selling elsewhere. One of the things to remember, though, is that your your market potentially is much bigger. So whereas if you've got a, 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 a market store, you're selling locally and that's it, and that's your marketplace. If your product doesn't sell in that marketplace, it might still sell somewhere else 30, 40 miles away or 100 miles away. I bought a hedge a few months ago by post. It came down from Scotland. <laughs> a, and hedge. Bought a hedge. <laughs> it's well. a very small plant. But we bought a hedge that way. Uh, you know, so you can, you can do that, which means you're tapping into new markets and it de-risks de things which I think is an important point but there are costs as well of setting up the site and everything else so it, there's a balance Another thing that was mentioned there was photos so obviously if you if you go into a physical shop you, you, can, you can touch the product, you can see it 
Um, so do you think f photos take are, are very, very important now for online shops, that they have to be very careful about taking very good photographs of goods and, and actually paying out for good photography? This is going to come back to trust to you. Um, so it's an issue of, of how the, how good that, that photography is. It's going to be a little bit of the factor as to whether the consumer believes in the site and is prepared to buy from them. If they know the site or know the company, that's less of an issue. Um, a well-taken photograph is going to get you started, but again, you're going to learn and you're going to want to, to get better quality photography as you go forward. Now, uh, let's move on to um, a different type of e-commerce site. The um, Aura Decor of Teresa and Les is, uh, Liz is a, uh, it's a very big site with a whole range of different types of products um, you know, that could sort of satisfy all sorts of different homes. Um, Mel is the owner of a mastectomy swimwear specialist called Kalea. Um, Claire, they are very, very specialist. Um, I started by asking Mel what she would have done differently if she was starting all over again. Well, that's a good question. I mean, we've been running for just over three years. And, um, well, I think, I think we've made sure that we created a, a shop with a real niche in the market. Our ranges are very high end, so we don't compete with the um, high street brands. But at the start, um, what we did was we, we brought in a few ranges that weren't specialised enough. So I think if we were to do it again, we would be more, we would be more niche. You import from all over the world, don't you? Isn't that a, a difficult um, proposition for an online retailer? It is. It's really difficult and it's definitely something that we, we do struggle with. Yes. Um, it takes a lot of planning and um, and a very good eye and also we do have to spend a lot of time at shows, scouring the internet, looking for new designers and styles. However, having said that, we are very lucky because one of our team members is very good at this so she sort of helps a lot in that area. But yes, it, it, it can be a struggle. It can be difficult. How important do you think it is to be on that page one of Google that everybody talks about? And how difficult is it up to, to get up there? I think it is very important, actually. In particular, Google AdWords has always worked very well for us. Um, and actually, we can see in the website stats that the number of visitors directly relates to the number of sales. Um, return on investment is actually quite easy to establish. SEO is a completely different beast and requires a lot more application and longer time frames, more ongoing investment, etc. But blogs, social media, um, activity, you know, around newsletters is also very important. It is really important, I think, to be on page one if you can be. And what, what do you think, um, what do you think is the key to success? The key to success, well, it's, it's hard work, it's working as a team, it's being enthusiastic, it's, um, you, it's surrounding yourself with people who have got lots of different energies that bring something else to the table, um, being positive. Enjoying what you're doing as well. We do do that. We, we really like to regroup and, and have fun um, whilst we are doing that and, and bringing, bringing new, new things to the table, bringing new ideas, always being positive. That is really important. I suppose when you're online, you don't get to spend as much time uh, with the customers as, as you might. Do you, do you actually talk to the customers much at all? Well, we do. Um, we, we obviously chat over the phone, but actually it's really nice to have face-to-face with customers because then they can feel and see what they're um, what they're buying or what they should well, what they maybe would buy and um, so we do we actually visit a lot of hospitals and actually even more so than that we might even I mean I'm in the past and I know my team members in the past have taken stock to people's houses so they can actually see what see what see what we're selling and that's important because I think customer interfacing even though it is an online business is is paramount um, so it's all about building relationships and taking those relationships further in terms of keeping up with people once they've brought items, letting them know that new stock and, and new ideas and newsletters. So um, your database of your, of, of your customers is, is really important. Quite interesting, isn't it? Because actually what you're talking about is almost like a combination of an online shop and a, a personal service, really. So. You know, so this sort of like balance between you know bricks and mortar and and online doesn't sound as though it's it's quite as distinguished in your business. No, you're right. It's not. I mean, obviously, the swimwear business. It's all about sunshine. That's that's sort of our issue, I suppose. You know, when the sun is out, people buy costumes. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's not like today, they don't. Um, 
So we were, you know, that, that could be another battle in its own right. But yeah, internet businesses are difficult. They are tricky. There's no doubt about it. And you can't go into it thinking, oh, well, I'm just going to set up a business on the internet and it's all going to go swimmingly. Excuse the pun. <laughs> well, on that note, thank you ever so much for, for your contribution. And uh, sure. just before you go, just uh, tell people how they can uh, have a look at your online shop. Yes, well, have a look at our website, which is um, www.kalea.co.uk. And, um, yeah, we're selling some beautiful swimwear at the moment. So, yes, please do have a look. And uh, that was Mel, Melanie Nicholson of Kalea uh, Mistakes Me Swimwear. Um, Stephen, she talked quite a lot about databases and newsletters, mm. and, and they seem to have a, a, a quite a tight relationship with their customers. Is that the sort of um, thing that you would expect in a, a niche marketplace, or is it the sort of thing that you really ought to be doing regardless? Regardless, absolutely. It's something. It's it's much easier and strong, very strong in a, in a niche marketplace like that, where they're going to have repeated customers. But absolutely you need to get to hold of those customers and retain them and know them as you would if they came into your restaurant or your shop and you got to know them as a local customer. Um, I think what's important though is that they shouldn't just see them as an advertising opportunity. So what a lot of people do is they get the email address and then continue to send that person emails no matter what. Um, and yes, they have an option to, to unsubscribe, but they just keep sending the same product to them. What I think is better, what some of the good online retailers do is that they start to offer discounts to those people, for example. So it doesn't have to be a financial discount, but it's some form of loyalty, true loyalty scheme, where you're showing that you're valuing that customer. Now, that's a good retail practice, whether you're online or offline. Um, but for some reason, when we're online, people start to think, actually, we've got their email address now. I can just send them emails, and that'll lead to business. Better still to actually recognize that getting that customer in the first place costs you quite a lot of money. The acquisition cost of getting a customer is high. And so getting them and keeping them is worth a little bit off the price or an extra bonus or whatever. Um, there's one of the retailers I, I, I buy from where you occasionally find a packet of sweets in the box with it yeah. and things like that as you get the delivery it's a nice little touch it's that little bit of extra surprise um you could probably go further than the sweets but actually maybe as i say discounts or membership uh, or uh, perhaps even exclusive product yeah and I, th I also sort of think that um this concept of relationship rather than i'm the seller and you're the buyer and that's how we're going to inter in, you know interact actually developing that relationship giving them treats, actually finding out more about them, actually giving them information that might not be anything to do with the product that you're selling but 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 is in some way relevant to them is is going to develop that Definitely. that relationship and if it's a strong relationship then they're less likely to buy elsewhere aren't they? Absolutely. And they're more likely to recommend you as well. Now, one of the other things that uh, we haven't touched on yet um, is this whole sort of concept of being on page one of Google, um, the whole Google, Google AdWords to SEO. How important is that? Mel said it's very important. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. How do people get good at that? Well, should we just clarify what SEO is yes. for anybody who might not? So that's search engine optimization, And it's basically, it's about making sure that your website appears highly on, on Google and, and other search engines. Um, and there's a lot of tricks to it and it's constantly changing so it's not something you can go to somebody and say get it there once and then it stays there you'll be knocked off very rapidly so you have to keep working up there and there are lots of things you can do you can pay money and that will get you up on the advertise side and then after, after you get picked up from that you'll start to appear more on the other side but you can also work with social media build your presence um, getting your, your Google Plus page for your business as well as your website which is relatively simple to set up will already start to rank you more highly and all those tools and it's a, it is a battle to do it it's also so important that you keep yourself visible in other ways so if you are a physical retailer as well or you want to advertise then then do so and a lot of online retailers now are advertising in the traditional medias as well to drag people to their to their stores it really is becoming um, a sort of multi-channel game this Absolutely. retailing isn't it but then I suppose customers um, are accessing information in so many different ways you know and, and they are still going down the high street but they are, have, have got their computers at home then they've got their smartphones in the pockets it's it's all um, it's all sort of it's all go at every point in the in the game really absolutely isn't it? yeah um, so we've talked about setting up shop we've talked about planning the site we've touched on getting customers um, what I think seems to be pretty clear is it's not a terribly simple way of making money uh, keeping it going without incurring massive additional costs and all of those sorts of things are really really important so our last clip is um, me going back to Jason Salmon of FL1 Digital to hear how easy it is to manage your shop once it's up and what help there is that's out there 
the sites themselves are actually very easy to manage. Putting new products, changing pictures, that sort of thing. That that's that tends to be quite straightforward these days. It's usually a question of logging into the website, changing whatever uh, pictures or text you need, and clicking save. It, it literally is that simple these days. I think the thing that a lot of online retailers really underestimate is the marketing plan and actually getting people to the website to buy in the first place. In a way, the website's kind of the easy bit. Getting them there, that's not so that's not so easy. Now the other the other aspect though is there's quite a few people out there that have already got sites that they're not mm-hmm. managing terribly well in terms of, of content and um, I believe you do too, some training programs that can help people who have got set up and that are in a bit of a muddle is that right? Yes that's right yeah um, it started a few years ago a little bit by accident if I'm honest because I found we were having the same meetings over and over again talking about the same thing so we had the idea of rather than doing three meetings why don't we have one meeting and invite the three people along and that kind of gave the idea of the workshops that we've run in St Albans um, I mean at one stage we were running 10, 11, 12 different workshops and they're basically just short two hour sessions really that kind of taught people about anything from Google Analytics to advertising to using WordPress to planning and creating a website um, we've kind of turned that into a whole different side of our business now so we've got about 23 different courses we run um, just in terms of uh, w- WordPress and WooCommerce and e-commerce, there's about three different courses we've got around that whole subject area. But there's also plenty of information on our website that can advise on that sort of thing too. What's your website address, Jason? Um, our website is fl1digital.com. We've also got we've got plenty of information on e-commerce up there. Um, there's some guides on getting set up on the web. Uh, there's also uh, a great article on how to write a web design brief, so it tells you everything that you should be asking a web designer or thinking about. And there's also an example of a web design brief that you can download and fill in. That sounds absolutely brilliant. It sounds like just the sort of place that people need to go. Thank you so much for your time, Jason. And uh, let's hope we see some uh, very nice, successful St Albans websites going up. Thanks a lot. That was Jason Salmon again of FL1 Digital with lots and lots of um, lots of free advice, lots of information on their website and uh, forms that you c- that can really help you with your planning. Um, Stephen, there is quite a lot of good advice out there. Um, there's no doubt about the fact that um, with the price uh, to market to set up in the first instance being relatively low, the ability to actually get cracking is is um, you know is not so difficult these days. Um, but actually keeping going and and building a business and and making sure that you're doing all of the right things without spending lots and lots of money, it's it's clearly not that easy a game. This e-commerce. You certainly have to keep a focus on it, and just as any retailer does, they'll turn up on a Monday morning, look at the sales for the last week and decide what to do with their with their normal business and you have to do the same online as well so you have to keep changing and keep addressing it and in time you'll have to invest in those resources but that should be backed off against showing the signs of revenue that pays for that as well um, if you invest in one without the other then you're doing it wrong and you need to get it right before you start to grow it too rapidly um, so how do you know that you're going to get it I mean how at what point do you actually start thinking right we've we've got to that sort of level now we're going to crank it up well it's back a little bit to where we started earlier so it's analytics it's looking at seeing that you're getting the people into your website first of all so make sure your marketing is correct and then once you've got them it's making sure you're converting them and you start at that center point to to look to see how people are coming to the site and what happens to them afterwards if you're getting those people and you're capturing them and you're making sales from them then it's a question of doing the mathematics as to whether or not the cost of acquiring those customers is going to lead you back to the profitability in the long run um, and to grow that once you've got that once you've got 10 customers who are giving you money then you can invest more in your marketing to get more people in and make it a thousand customers and is there always a, a sort of like a straightforward equation between number of people that are viewing on the site and potential and number of sales? Absolutely not. It's it's how you engage and capture those people, how you deal with, with, with them when they get there, whether your site actually gives them the information they need is easy to use. Um, I think ease of use of website is far more important than a pretty website. Um, although the product needs to look good, you do need to make sure that, you, that the pers- person can buy from you easily and they know what's, what's happening. And we touched on Amazon earlier in, in the discussions, I think it was off air yeah. really, but um, Amazon don't have the nicest looking website, but, but clearly they're probably one of the biggest, the world's biggest um, online retailers. It seems to be working for them, not, not being the most attractive. Uh, but it's very efficient, it's very easy to use and you find what you want and you're able to make your purchase quickly and what's more you know it'll turn up very rapidly after that. And tell us, is Amazon making money yet? Because it wasn't for a very, very long time, was it? I'm not sure I know their latest financials <laughs> on that. Um, it's difficult to know because their money is global and where their money is, you'd, you'd never know. 
Uh, and on that note, I didn't let's, it, move, I let's move <laughs> away from Amazon and that. Are there any other sort of key tips that you would give people if they're at the stage when they're, uh, you know, thinking, should I do this or shouldn't I? You know, what are the big questions they ought to be asking themselves before they, they embark on this rather complex journey? I think the answer to that one lies in, in the d- d- decision not to do it as well. And if you don't try and go online, you're deciding to stay out of something that is a growth area for the future. So if you don't attempt it and have a go, you're never going to know. Um, you do need to invest that some time in doing it. There's very few businesses will survive without taking an online presence going forward. And so they need to commit and find out how it's going to work for them. Yes, you might be a sandwich shop and that's, that's okay and it works for you. But outside of very, very localised businesses that are really trading on the street, um, they need to try it just so they know what's going to come out of it. Um, now, you've clearly got a wealth of knowledge, a lot of background in this area. How do people start engaging with you? How do people work with you? Um, the easiest way is to go onto my website, www.leapfrog.digital. There's no .com or .co.uk on there. Um, you'll see that cut confused to the me at first, actually, <laughs> there you I have go. to say. Yeah. Yes. Um, you'll see a sign that says Cut to the Chase, and when you get there, you have options, and one of those is to book a free consultation. Um, if I get lots of inquiries, the delivery time will go out on that, but I will get to them eventually. And, and what sort of thing can you help people with then? So some somebody wants to, to say, start an e-commerce store, can you help them right from the beginning, right to... Absolutely. I and, won't and do all of that myself. I won't do all that myself. I'll bring in specialists who will help me to do the individual parts. Um, but it is the whole journey. So what we're looking to help them with is to work out the right product all the way through to distribution. But it's most likely to going to focus around how you get people to their website and then how you capture them. So my focus initially will be around the analytics on the website. If they're not got enough people coming, we'll be looking at the, um, at the way in which they attract them to that site. If they have got enough people coming, then it's how we engage with them. And of course, if they haven't got a site at all, then that's fine. We start with that process. And uh, what will people get in that one hour free consultation? We'll be talking to them about what it is that they've already achieved, what they've tried um, and what their ambitions are. And then we'll be looking at next steps forward as to how they can go forward with their business. So just tell everybody again, Stephen, before um, before we close the show, um, just how do people get in touch with you? So the website is www.leapfrog.digital. Thank you very much. That was Stephen Swan of Leapfrog Digital. Uh, We've had a number of clips from Jason Salmon of FL1 Digital, shop owners Teresa and Liz of Aura Decor Designs, and Melanie Nicholson of Kalea Swimwear. Claire, it's been, as always, a really busy show. It's rushed along. What do you think uh, are the key learnings from uh, your perspective? I think I think uh, one thing that Stephen mentioned was that you can't you can't just make a shop put, put a shop online and then expect people to come to it. You, I mean, it's an ongoing thing. You have to work at it. You have to do your SEO, um, and and that's something different, I suppose, from running a physical shop. M- m- maybe that relates to what you might do with news, might have done with newspaper articles and things like that but I mean that is quite a consideration and I mean I mention it because I'm, one of my cousins sells sells one product on her website she sells different versions of it but she, she was a bit like you were saying very excited to start up her website but then didn't quite get that you have to then get as Stephen said not, not only people to come and visit the website but to be um, impressed enough to then go and purchase the product so I think those are the main the main lessons really it's been a fantastic show um, there's so much more to learn um, on e-commerce and the world is changing so quickly um, barriers to entry don't seem so high but as always what we're finding is that it takes hard work so you've been listening to the business on Radio Verulam <laughs> The Business, sponsored by Kingston Smith Chartered Accountants. If there's anything in the show you want to talk to us about, phone us on 01727 839 926 or email thebusiness at radioverulam.com.